Welcome to Retro Logic. I'm Sam Wagers, back in 2024 for a brand new podcast, a brand new year. Joined as always by John Cummins. How are you tonight, John? I'm good. I was kind of hoping we would get Adam to join us, but he's busy on Thursdays. I picked a bad day. Yeah, well, you know that's that's the thing, right? It's uh, scheduling is always uh, always hitting moving targets, right? So uh, we'll we'll make room for Adam uh, one of these days. Uh, I'm sure he has lots of lots of things to talk about. <laughs> uh, but uh, Retro Logic, as a reminder, is not just a podcast; it is a whole community of retro gamers. We have a active, friendly, and free Discord with giveaways, contests, the uh, the latest on topic retro rewind for F Zero X just wrapped up. I, I tried to add some competition in. At the You're end of so that close. One, but, uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Uh, Bozo is just too good. Now he's the one that like obliterated everyone in Wave Race too, right? I believe so. He, or was that someone else? He yeah. appears to be a he's good at racing, uh, yeah, racing game. He's good at racing games. <laughs> he uh, he chose ten bucks from the PlayStation shop so he must have something he's wanting to get there we go yeah not just nintendo lest you believe that i know we talk about nintendo on the show probably more than anything else but uh we we got some playstation fans in there too nintendo's uh and we also of course have our entire family of retro podcasts such as retro groove all about music and music history film logic about movies and On Topic Retro, which I just mentioned, dedicated to one video game per episode, hosted by John himself. And you can find all that usually on our website, which seems to be having some difficulties. Um, but you can also find our Discord, and you can find all those podcasts anywhere podcasts are found uh, as well. So get them added to your feed. Look in your, your preferred podcasting app. They should all be there. So... Moving on to that housekeeping, since we mentioned on topic retro, what's what's the status with that, John? Uh, I believe Ocarina of Time was recorded. Ocarina of yes. Time was released right before Christmas, That's live. so yeah. there's there's before that, Christmas. and then uh, I've kind of got a late start to the year, uh, but I plan on I think next week is going to be a double uh, two episode week. I think I'm going to try to do F Zero and Majora's Mask in the same week if I can. If not, Majora's oh, Mask will be okay. very early the following week. I usually tend to record those on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. So, uh, now is the is the next Zelda after that the Oracle games? Uh, I thought I thought those came out afterwards, but you could be right. After no, uh, after Majora. Oh, after Majora. No, yeah, they're. I think they're. Yeah. The, they would be the next games after Majora. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's obviously <laughs> Game Boy Color. It's got to be before Winter. Yeah, you right? had me thinking for a minute. I was like, wait a minute. Did I put Majora before those and they wasn't supposed to? I thought I had them in chronological order. <laughs> no, no, because I know because I've been playing Oracle of Ages and Tingle's in it, right? And he, I'm, I'm fairly certain he debuted in yes. Majora's Mask. So, yeah. Yeah, they, they've got to be um, close together. Maybe 2001 for the Oracle yeah, games. Okay. I need to I need to wrap that up then. That's we'll we'll talk about games we need to wrap up. But, That's right. Uh, I don't know. I want to join in on that. I've been. I want to play both of them. Is the thing. Are you doing both together? Uh, yes. The plan is to do them both, both together. Oracle games. Uh, and I really have. I a think lot it's going to be a long episode. I'm but, like uh, I'm like two thirds of the way through Ages, but I need to do seasons. Gosh, yeah. I haven't even touched it. I need to play through seasons again. I've played through Ages more recently. Um, or at least get a little ways into it to get another, you know, it'll all start coming back once I start playing it again. But, uh, I haven't had as much, I've been playing other things kind of last year. I was, I was trying to play these. It had been a long time since I played some of these, the older Zelda games. So I was trying to play through them as I was going through the, the episodes, but now we're getting into the more, the little bit more modern Zelda games, uh, that I still have a, pretty good memory of so we'll right so lots of stuff coming for on topic retro uh speaking also uh uh since we haven't mentioned since our last regular podcast show of things that went live 
around Christmas, the Game of the Year 30 episode, if you have not listened to it, is a doozy. Uh, and I am uh, loath to report the results that came in to decide our tie for the best soundtrack <laughs> of 1993. Uh, Plock has been defeated. Plock has been diddled again. By Star Fox by a single <laughs> vote. So... If you are that one vote that, that made the difference, then you you have diddled Plock yep. again. Star Fox diddled Plock uh, for the soundtrack. Yep, that, that is a thing that happened. Um, I've been going uh, live a lot over Christmas break, uh, so it wasn't the normal Mega Monday routine, but I did 12 days of Xmas, uh, as I've called. So the, I, I went all out. You know, if it... I don't think I can ever top this, but I, I played 12 different Mega Man X games on 12 different days. Did you beat them all? Uh, subsequently. rolled. Yes, I rolled credits on every game. <laughs> I did not 100% every game, but I rolled credits on every game. Uh, interestingly enough, you may notice uh, a slight change through the playlist because I, I opened every with my little graphic that listed the games I was going to play. I listed Day 5 twice initially, so I had an extra game on there. And that game was Mega Man X Command Mission, which in no way was I going to roll credits on in a single day because it's like a 26-hour RPG. <laughs> um, so I did not play Command Mission, which I was happy to do. But I did do both ZX games, which are not anywhere near as short as like me- the first Mega Man yeah. X. Um, so it, it was it was quite a marathon, quite a little a little marathon there, but I had a lot of fun doing it. That whole playlist is up on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel, Third Strongest Mole. So if that interests you, you can watch that. And I will be going back to Battle Network. As a matter of fact, I had jumped back into Battle Network 4 uh, for the third and final time uh, playing through the game to get that 100%. Uh, and that was this Monday. So that's usually Monday nights around 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Film Logic had their 2023 movie report card and Retro Groove their albums of the year special. So lots of year end recap, looking back content. It kind of comes with the retro territory. That's right. Um, that's all of our housekeeping. So let's play some prices retro. is retro round of the new year which i just realized we ended the year tied yeah we did so we'll have to so is, is this the tiebreaker yeah and i have to or do, or do we need something special well no i have to look back and see i know it's the end of the year but i don't know when our season officially ends i'll have to look back okay i don't know that uh no, because I know that Dane and I didn't start this show on a, in January, so. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, I think it actually might have been, like, November? December. Somewhere around in there, yeah. One of those first episodes I was a guest on, and I think it was December. Might have been. So we might have already rolled over the new, we, we might set a fresh a fresh date for the new season because... I usually like to change things up and and uh, shift stuff around. So maybe we'll count this as part of the third we, season. We might have to retire the robot. Yeah, until retire the well, robot. Well, Dan's got some is talking a little bit about coming back in some kind of capacity. Well, I, I will I will drag him back here because this year we have the 25th anniversary of Donkey Kong 64. That's right. We got at least we cannot cover that without. Got to at Dan. least talk about that. But, yeah. All right. Without further ado, the price is retro. Let's get this moving. Uh, if this is your first time playing the price is retro, here is how we play. I'm going to list off four or five games. Everyone guesses on how much the lot is worth in total. And whoever is closest to the actual value wins that round. Uh, everyone has a list. Everyone guesses on each other's list. At the end, the player that wins the most rounds wins the episode. This is another duel. We don't have the robot. It's pretty much just uh, one-on-one here. 
one list each, who gets closer. Uh, so, uh, would you like to do the honors and present the first list of the year, John? Sure. This list is somewhat tied to the uh, show topic for tonight. These are all games that I plan on trying to play this year at some point in time. These games are all on my goal list. Okay. These games are also all complete in box. Uh, I don't own all of these games complete in box, but that's what I chose for this list. The first game is Blue Dragon for the Xbox 360. The second game is Tales of Fantasia for the Game Boy Advance. The third game is Dragon Quest VIII, Journey of the Cursed King. And the fourth game is Bomberman Quest for the Game Boy Color. What's Dragon Quest VIII for? Uh, PlayStation 2, sorry. PlayStation 2? Yep. Okay. And what was the last one? Bomberman Quest for the Game Boy Color. Bomberman Quest for the Game Boy Color. And these are all complete in box? Yes. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to say $440. $440. Okay. Oh, you're close. The total value of my lot is $519.46. Okay. It's not bad. It's not bad. It would have been a lot more if I would have had the 3DS version of Dragon Quest Eight on here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're you're pretty close, though. Well, you know, that's... I don't know. We our, our rules usually go off of absolute difference right not like percent difference so so bigger lots can be kind of a but but you know since we went to the rounds thing it you know when we have guests on it's more about just getting reasonably close per lots too so i'll do a quick breakdown the uh, blue dragon for the xbox 360 complete in box is 23 dollars and eight cents uh tales of fantasia for the game boy advance complete in box is 88 dollars 85 cents uh, Dragon Quest VIII, Journey of the Cursed King for the PlayStation 2 complete in box is $22.53. And Bomberman Quest for the Game Boy Color is uh, complete in box is a whopping $385. Yeah. That's, I pretty much knew that's how the breakdown would go. It was a little off on the exact amounts. Yeah. All RPGs, right? Bomberman Quest is yep. an RPG spinoff. It has RPG I features. I've that before. I remember looking that up and being like, oh, too expensive yeah. for me. <laughs> Even loose, too expensive for me. We'll see. I don't know. I've, then again, I got, I got job changes in the pipe. No. Uh, all right. Well, my list is also sort of running with our theme, uh, but these are actually all games that I acquired last year. Uh, so, and they are in the condition I acquired them, actually. Uh, not at the price I acquired them, though. These are at the current price charting values. So we've got Soul Blazer for the Super Nintendo, loose. Batman for the Sega Genesis, complete in box. War Song for the Sega Genesis, loose. And Sky Gunner for the PlayStation 2, Complete in box. I feel like I've used Sky Gunner like a million times on Prices Retro. Yeah. But I don't care. I like bringing it up. So I'm going to go with 175. And I will say that I have recently purchased Sky Gunner myself. <laughs> so I, I do have a little bit of uh, knowledge to the value of that game. The other ones I don't. Retrologic effect there. All right, one seventy-five. The total value is three hundred forty-two dollars oh, and forty-three cents. Yeah, I, I fooled. You did you. I, I said these were games I acquired? I usually don't spend this much, but these are like the four most expensive games I bought last year. 
Uh, Soul Blazer for the Super Nintendo is one hundred seventeen thirty eight. I actually got one for a uh, hundred flat, um, just off of eBay. Uh, Batman for the Sega Genesis Complete is one hundred and five dollars seventy five cents. I got that a little bit less than that, uh, actually, courtesy of our friend Eric Plum nice. this year, last year rather. Uh, War Song for the Sega Genesis Loose is forty five dollars. And Sky Gunner for the PS2 complete in box is seventy four dollars and thirty cents. Oh, I had that one correct. It was the uh, all those other ones I was way off on. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, I think you won that one. Yeah, I think I think so. so. Right, I was off about like seventy. You were off. Uh, you were off almost uh, eighty. Like I was off one seventy five. One seventy five. Roughly. There we go. First win of the year. Enjoy the lead while it lasts. Uh, do we have a trivia card for tonight? Uh, yes, I do have some. Let me grab this. Yeah, I could. I, I think I've already done all those. Let me grab the other pile. I think I did this last time. Because I remember the questions. You just read all the questions beforehand so that you would know them. Hey, yeah, no. Because they're so hard, you know? Yeah, no, I really don't want to know all these questions. Uh, here we go. Let's just do this one. Uh, which game followed Grand Theft Auto Vice City in the main Grand Theft Auto game series? Oh, man. The Grand Theft Auto <laughs> questions. <laughs> they get you every time. They always get me. Uh, That's all right. You'll gosh. know the follow-up question. I honestly I honestly don't know. I don't know which one Vice City is. Didn't they just switch to going back to numbers afterwards? Not after Vice City. Do they do they all have okay, they all have subtitles after Vice City? No, just a, just this one. Oh, and then they go okay. back to numbers after this one. Is it San Andreas? It is San Andreas. There we go. Yep. I I got a Grand Theft Auto question. So they, it was weird. They went to three, or they had three, and then Vice City was kind of like Majora's mask. It was based off of they already had everything built, so they just change the map around and change the theme and release another game with Vice City and then with San Andreas it was basically the same thing too. They already had the engine. PS2 was already really long in the tooth and they just they threw this one out with a different theme again. And then it wouldn't be till the next console generation we would get four. Yeah, it's it's funny when games do the numbered for a while and they get like bored of it or whatever too. Or like, and then you have like the opposite. Like King of Fighters used to be named after, after the, the year, year yeah. And then it just went to like fifteen. It's like it's just fifteen. And then no, the real kicker to me. What though, was fifteen in two thousand fifteen? No, I think I it was think later, it was. wasn't it? Wasn't it like eighteen or? Yeah, it was like seventeen, eighteen, something like that. Yeah, because I think thirteen is when they switched. Or 12. Yeah. I just know they were numbered by the year for a long time. Yeah. But the the real one that blew me away, I think, because I actually actually played a little bit of Super Robot Wars 40. Oh, yeah. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that can't possibly be the 40th Super Robot Wars game. It's, It's named because it's the 40th anniversary of Super Robot Wars game. But here's the kicker. The 40th... Super Robot Wars game came out on the N64. Because of all the spinoffs? There are so many of those. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I, knew, I know that they're like, the series itself goes all the way back to like Famicom. So, and there was yeah. a bunch on the Famicom. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. <laughs> it's absolutely And Game nuts. Boy. And... That, is, that is a rabbit hole. If you want a series to beat this year, do not pick Super Robot Wars. I'm just telling you now. 
Most of them are Japanese. I was going to say, you'd have to learn how to read Japanese. Uh, yeah, 40 is, other than the original generation ones, uh, because they had all original characters, uh, the licensing hell um, of, you know, being able to put Gundam characters yep. and uh, Evangelion characters and whatever other... Kaiju and, and all kinds of different else. stuff. Yes, yeah, Mausinger is the other, like, big one in there. But, like... You, you can't do that. I think 30... <laughs> you can't do that in America. 30 was, like, Until around 40. PSP generation, right? Probably. I don't know. If I remember, right? Because I remember looking at some of those games... Uh, because surprisingly, like, PS3 and, and PSP saw quite a few of them come over in English. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it just that leads right into our topic, though. Goals for the year. Uh, one of those is probably going to be games that have been backlogged uh, or series that we uh, we want to uh, notch away, so to speak. I've been working my way back through Mega Man Battle Network, of course. I want to wrap that up, and I want to do it streaming because uh, I have played these games before. But by the end of this uh, project of mine, I will have truly played. Well, I guess I can't say that. Unless I buy a Wonder Swan and the Wonder Swan game, uh, but I'll, I'll have played the main series, exempting spinoffs and including most of the spinoffs, and I'll have truly played the main series because I'll have played both versions of every game. Um, I so that's one I'm working through. I seen a Wonder Swan the other day uh, when I was in Nashville. Uh, I, I Nashville is really weird. There's not a whole lot of retro gaming going on there apparently because I whenever I looked. For as big of a city as Nashville is, I only found like two retro shops. Uh, they, they've got some like weird uh, kind of retro electronic shops that have like PCs and like all kinds of stuff, but I didn't see anything game related there. Uh, but I did find one shop and I went in and it was like, it was actually pretty cool. Like they had a lot of different things. The uh, supply was not an issue with this place, but they did in the case. They had a Wonder Swan color there. But it was two hundred bucks. Uh, yeah. So I was like, eh. Well, yeah, and Rockman EXE for the Wonder Swan also costs like hundred fifty bucks. So Yeah, you'd have three hundred dollars just to play one game. Yep. Yep. And I can't even stream it. That's the other yeah. thing. Yeah. So there's a way there's gotta be a way to a, stream the Wonder Swan. Oh, I'm sure there is, but somebody's figured it is out. It's something I'm gonna do. Just put a hold it hold your phone know. over it and record it. <laughs> yeah maybe. set up a you, set up a you could, camera you could yeah it just wouldn't be exactly high uh high yeah, fidelity use your use your uh, webcam and just hover it over the screen and we mentioned it earlier though and on topic retro is a good uh case for this i've also been trying to work my way through some of the zelda games i've never played um i don't think i'd necessarily make it my goal to work through every zelda game uh, I would reserve, because uh, I haven't played Four Swords or Triforce Heroes, and I probably won't unless I have a way to actually play the multiplayer. Um, otherwise, I just don't feel like that's high priority. But the handheld games that I missed out on, uh, especially those I have access to now on the Switch, yeah. um, Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons, and Minish Cap. Um, maybe I'll even make room for uh, Spirit Tracks in there. We'll see. Yeah, I want to, uh, some of those multiplayer ones are ones that I need to go back to as well. Um, it kind of stinks too, because uh, Triforce Heroes is basically unplayable now, like multiplayer, because of the online be- is, I think. Well, I, you have local wireless, right? Yeah, but then, I mean, you'd have to have three option. people that yeah. have the game and yeah, exactly. can do it, but what. I think I guess until March you could still try to find, it, but then you got to find people that are playing it. That that might be a struggle yeah. as well. But um, mm-hmm. Four Swords Adventures is another one that I think would be cool. But again, you you still have to have uh, a handful of people in a room with like link cables and all that stuff. And 
Well, this is the whole reason I was quite pleased to see uh, like Kirby and the Amazing Mirror come to NSO. Yeah, that, it could be a it's actually much precursor easier to do that now. So maybe we'll get Zelda Four Swords Adventures on there. Do you have any uh, any games you're you're on your uh, on your list, so to speak? So I did mention four, just kind of right off the the top um, for our prices retro, but. Um, kind of, kind of the main goal that I've set, uh, for this year is that I'd like to try to play at least, at least one retro game a month outside of retro rewind, uh, for myself, uh, to try to cut down on my backlog. And then I've also, uh, cause you know, we, we tend to, to forget about some of the retro games we have playing new games that come out especially whenever you know i've got every console to play on now so (laughs) it gets a little crowded Mm -hmm. but i want to try to play at least one so i've got a list of of 12 early ones uh that i'm holding on to and i'm also this is kind of with uh talking to zach a little bit about some of uh collecting goals I think if for each month I want to try to trade out some of my favorite uh, loose games that I have for a complete in box and try to transition. Cause I've kind of hit a point in my collection now where I don't have a whole lot of things that I'm really just seeking after all the time. So it, for the sake of space, you know, now I think I'm, I'm going to try to convert some of my favorite things uh, that I don't have complete in box over to complete in box. So it still gives me something to collect, but uh, I'm not necessarily expanding my collection uh, outward, I guess. <laughs> Which is also good for the community because it means every time I I get something complete in box, I, I'll have something loose for sale. <laughs> there you go. Pass pass there it on, go. and I've already been kind of working it a little bit. Uh, going back to games looking at to one I keep saying I need to go back to because I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Um, I played East 1 on the Turbo Graphics Mini. So it's actually the East 1 and 2 Turbo CD disc that's emulated on the Mini. Yeah. And uh, I actually liked it more than I thought I would. So I've been meaning to go back and continue East 2 because it, it's like a direct, it's basically just an expansion of East 1. Um and I know I also have East 3 for the Super Nintendo. Um, so I want to play those three games, and I would also like to play at least one of the more modern East games, just to be able to compare them. I think it might actually make for a very good show if we can get an uh, expert on the East series on with us. to kind of Because t- it is one of the oldest RPG series, and it's actually older than Final Fantasy by a couple months. Not older than Dragon Quest, but older than Final Fantasy. Yeah. By it came out the same year, I believe. I think the East three for the Super Nintendo is different, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the modern East games are quite different too. East three, as I understand it, is kind of a Zelda two kind of game, uh, whereas East one and two had the bump combat, and East modern East is very action RPG uh, on the whole. At least that's my impression of it. Well, I mean, I think that there is a. I think that East three on the Super Nintendo is actually different from East three on the other platforms. <clears throat> oh, is what I was saying. That I'm not sure about. Uh, I'd have to look further into it, but I, I think it is because I know there's also East three on the uh, PC eighty eight and the uh, Turbo Graphics as well. Um, and I think that the the Super Nintendo one is slightly different. Or it might even be a different game altogether. Um, I know there's something weird with like four or five that there were like two different East fives. Yeah, it says it, it gets confused. Yeah, there's a lot. There's <laughs> a lot of splits and branches for the East series. Uh, definitely, you know, may, that might be something that maybe we bring uh, some of the the guys that know the series a little bit better than we do on and maybe we just have an ease episode one time. Cause I also, uh, 
want to play through one and two on the uh, the mini as well. That's one of the things I want to do. Yeah, and just in general, I think I think getting the most out of the turbo mini because it has been quite exciting to me uh, as well. And that's actually kind of what you know. I talked about getting into shmups, but also I played East because I was like, uh, "What's on here that isn't a shmup?" <laughs> well, East for starters. Also, you know, Castlevania. Well, and there's like a few other, uh, a few other gems. Was there. it Utopia? Yeah. Which is also Utopia, Zelda. Like, uh, I don't know. Zelda. Yeah, New Utopia is one of those that just makes me want to play Zelda. Zelda instead. generic. But uh, you know, and then there's Bonk. But I mean, in Bonk, as as has been mentioned before, where is the Bonk? Yeah, fan Bonk base? doesn't get a lot of love around here. I, th- I think bonk Eric might be the only bonk base. guy. Yeah, as for collection goals, I don't really... I mean, I've never been somebody who collects for the sake of collecting. I, I collect games I want to play. Um, but who knows? Maybe maybe this will be the year I acquire a second Game Gear game. There you go. That's, uh, that's my goal. Increase my Game Gear collection by 100%. There, there are some good Game Gear games, and even the best Game Gear games are not super expensive. Well, what's, uh, what's a good Game Gear game? Uh, Crystal Warriors is good. I bought, I bought uh, oh, dang. Axe Battler. That's almost the one I have. I have Dragon Crystal. Yeah. I think it's <laughs> yeah Axe Battler. It's a Golden Axe game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have heard of Axe That Battler. I bought from Eric Plunk. Uh, that's a good one surprisingly the sonic games are not bad um for game gear uh, they're sonic games i don't trust you they're i mean they're game gear so they're a little bit technically okay technically i have played a sonic game on a game gear an actual game gear my dentist when i was a child my pediatric dentist for some reason loved sega he had a genesis in his office um in the waiting room and when you were getting like the fluoride treatment, you know, yep. like you just have to like bite down on it for a couple minutes because kids are restless. He would give them a game gear to play while you were just sitting there with the. That's a cool dentist right there. Mouth. It was a cool dentist, I, you know, but I think out of everything based on the, the kind of taste that I, I know you have, I would, I would highly suggest uh, crystal warrior. Cause it's a strategy, like a turn-based strategy game. Yeah, it is interesting to think back in the day, because I've gotten more into, um, like, import Super Nintendo games. There were a lot of them, but most of them just didn't get local. I mean, even famously Fire Emblem. But stuff like Front Mission, stuff like, you know, all of it was basically not getting brought over to the U.S. I guess because Sega was just doing better in North America than it was in Japan, by a lot of measures. Yeah, it was. It was promoting more aggressively. Especially in the U.K., but you know, I I mentioned stuff like stuff like War Song, stuff like Shining Force. Uh, really, the Genesis was the place to play strategy RPGs if you weren't Japanese. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of yeah. weird that we didn't get in it, get any Shining series games on the the Game Gear that I know of because yeah. it did so well in Genesis. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of weird. But no, Game Gear is kind of like an odd little. Like I've got a bunch of games for it, uh, but I, I definitely enjoy Game Boy a lot more. Maybe we'll get a Game Gear app for the NSO. I mean, I would be very open to more Sega apps because I feel like there's been... The Genesis was a bit underwhelming for me because there have been so many Genesis collections. Oh yeah, there's always <laughs> if you if you have that like there's a couple things that came to it that I was happy to see like Pulse Man because that was Sega Channel only outside Japan um, to see that released. Um, but yeah, I mean like most of those Genesis games I've already played and I still have access. Yeah, to. there's I just have them on the the collection. There's just a lot less must play Genesis games than there are Super Nintendo games. And it seems like the same ones that everyone wanted to play get regurgitated in those collections over and over again. Yeah. I mean, it's just like 
Nintendo putting out games oh, yeah. on the if, virtual console. If this console, is your first really. time playing Streets of Rage 2, it's a, it's a fantastic oh, game yeah. and you should play it. It's just, it doesn't matter to me anymore because I've played Streets of Rage 2 since WiiWare mm-hmm. days. It kind of... We virtual console. Speaking of Genesis, that's what the the next round of uh, voting for Retro Rewind is going to be is Genesis games. So we're we're going back to the Genesis. Yep. There you go, back to the beginning, so to speak. I would love to see a Saturn app. Actually, that's what I want. I want to see a Sega Saturn. I would even take a Master Black. System. Or a Saturn Mini. There, Master System, that's something I could... I, I, I joked when we were listing Sega A to Z about uh, my least favorite Master System game, Kensei Den. Yeah. Because it's one of two Master System games I own. Yeah, I've... And the other one is Penguin Land, and I love Penguin Land. I, I don't know why. I think the majority of my Master System collection has come from Eric. Because he was getting rid of a bunch of his... And I was like, well, you have all the good ones that I want right now, so I'll just I'll take those off your hands. So I've kind of just acquired his the the bits and pieces of his Master System collection over time. But there are still a handful of ones that I do want to get. Like I want an original uh Fancy Star. And uh gosh, there's another one. I got Gavelius from him. Which is again, these are some games that should come to the the NSO, of course, you can play Fantasy Star on, uh, like, I would just buy the yeah. Ages version. It's so much better. But just for just for my collection, I would like to have one for Master System. It's it's really not that expensive to collect for either. Those games are usually pretty cheap. It's kind of like Genesis. Genesis games, I think, as a whole, like, on yeah, average, the, you're going to spend less than 20 the bucks. The kicker is I don't see them, like, anywhere at my stores. Oh yeah, yeah. You're gonna like have to buy them Master online. Nobody has Master yeah. System games around here, but there's loads of the, them. Online. The only ones I've seen are always um, they're always light gun games that I wouldn't be able to play anyway because I'm I'm playing through the adapter on the um, the analog SG. Oh yeah, the controllers are not the same. Yeah, I do have a Master System and a light gun though, so if you do want to play some, you'll just have to come over sometime. So what about uh, goals for the show? Goals for RetroLogic? Uh, I think that... Well, I mean, for one, I think that we need to... We have a, a common goal that we would like to try to get some more guests on because this last this last bit has mainly just been us on here talking. Be nice to... Right, uh, and I, I know because Dan, Dan is the sociable one. He's, he's good about getting guests. He's good about finding guests, thinking of people who would be good guests. Um, I just, you know, I'm very uh, insular and this is why I'm on this, right? I, I like to stay home and play video games. I don't like to talk to people. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, guests, definitely more guests. And uh, I think specifically uh, new guests. We need some fresh meat to uh, liven up the show. Not that we don't love our recurring uh, guests that come back. Uh, But I think uh, that would, that would go a long way towards just making the show a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Uh, So if you're listening to this and you haven't been on a a guest on the show, but you would like to be uh, reach out to us, tell us all about how you want to come on and tell the world about how uh, Zool is an underrated classic and it deserves our attention. Or, or what have you. Another thing I we've, this is something I know that you've been working on more, but uh, trying to put together an idea of what our topic is going to be ahead of time. Cause a lot of times we're picking the topic like right before we do the show. It also helps us to make sure we uh, know who's going to be a guest. That and so. another, and then something that we have, been lacking due to that is you know not being able to get the community involved as much in the show topic mm-hmm. so i think it's in the long run it would be good for us to to get all that planned out and be able to ask the questions ahead of time and actually get response on the show and you know it's it's kind of been a while too but uh we need to reach out to the community for topics that they would like to to listen into as well 
I know that's something we've done in the past. There is kind of the uh, the the thing that we have been doing the show for a little while now, <laughs> and uh, topics topics can be harder to find whenever you've been around as long as we have. Well, you know, everything that released last year is technically retro now, right? That's right. By a certain definition. Well, I mean, even if you so, go by like the tenure rule, like that's the the Wii U is there. It's still rolling, rolling over. Yeah. The Wii U is now retro. I guess technically it was last year. Yeah. I mean, we use retro. Deal with it. But yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That That's the main thing, right? I mean, obviously, I like the show to be uh, just better overall. Uh, but that that's the most obvious one, I think, is to, to find new guests. And I think that helps us to still get... Uh, cover new ground, more interesting territory. Um, yeah. I think that I know one of the goals that I had for uh, kind of to run alongside with on topic retro is that I, I wanted to try to get together some, some community members and do some more like a uh, ranking of game series and stuff like that. And I just have not, this, this last year was a, a hard to find time for everything uh, with with my with just life and and having a starting over again with uh, kids having a toddler around it's kind of zaps all your time but it was definitely one of the things that I wanted to try to incorporate and also try to get you know to stream more but I haven't even been able to do that you've been doing more streaming than than I ever have. <laughs> well, look, I'm I'm never going to do as much streaming as I did in uh, those twelve days. Yeah, <laughs> that's even more than I did over in a twelve day span. That's even when I did extra life. That's even more than that, and that like totaled to like, yeah, each stream was more than two hours long on average. I think by the end, some of them were less than two because like Mega Man X, I can beat in like an hour or less, but. You get to those later games, they're longer, and also I don't know them as well, so I do game over. Um, yeah, it was probably over 30 hours <laughs> of streaming in 12 days. I was off work, though. I actually was just burning vacation time because I couldn't roll it over to next year. Yeah. So it was fun. It was actually a fun way to spend that vacation time that I would have been Otherwise, just playing Mega Man by myself, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a throwback. Uh, it's what I used to do at the end of uh, end of college terms, uh, is just hole up in my dorm and play every Mega Man game uh, when everybody else was either already gone for holidays or still cramming for exams. So when I was done with my exams, that's what I'd do. I'd play Mega Man in my dorm. I mean, what better to do? Exactly. It's Mega Man. But yeah, I think. Well, if that's all our goals for 2024, um, did you have something? More? I was just gonna say, yeah, I think that that's that's pretty much all I have. Hopefully, uh, by the next time we do a show, we'll already have have a guest picked out and have a topic that we can share with the community before we start recording. So that's 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 yeah. the goal for the next show. Let's say that. Sounds good to me. Uh, we do actually have, since you mentioned community involvement, I just remembered this was shared in the community couch. So I assume that means we need to talk about it on the show. And we actually talked about it on Discord a little bit already. Uh, Mike shared this uh, article from Games Radar about uh, some tweet went viral uh, about the biggest uh, generational leap in games. Uh, so Mike contends Saturn to Dreamcast uh, was a big jump. 128-bit online gaming, PC Engine, arcade perfection. Others argue the jump from GBA to PSP will never happen again in our time. I would consider the Wii to switch if Nintendo didn't make a Wii U. Um, I think this is kind of an odd... I mean, a lot of it comes down to like your definition of what a generational leap is. Because he's basically only comparing 
one company system to the one that replaced it, not really accounting for other systems that released in between. Yeah. So, which I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to define it, but then, you know, generational leaps are kind of all amount to marketing anyway. So, yeah, what the, the term generation is defined by what the market, you know, says is the next generation or whatever. But I mean, really, to me, that just what he mentions here with Saturn and Dreamcast. I mean, the Saturn had in the later part of its uh, time 3D games already. Uh, I mean, there was still quite a few 2D games. Like, that's kind of what Saturn was. Yeah, and the Dreamcast was well after PlayStation and 64. You had tons of that. So that's why, like, yeah, if if you really only went from Saturn to Dreamcast, but, like, I don't know, even the most diehard Sega fan probably had to acknowledge those other systems and, uh, over the course of that. Well, and kind of like really the big thing for Dreamcast was that, yeah, it was the first console that would go online. But when the Dreamcast came out, you could already play online on a PC, you know. So that wasn't well, something yeah, that was completely it, new. That's the other point is when you talk about generational leaps, what does that mean for PC, right? New New graphics cards come out every year. Yep. Sometimes multiple a year. Well, yeah, with um, PC, it's hard. It's even it, harder to define does, the generation these days because most PC games are coming out on consoles too, and almost every console game comes out on PC. Uh, you do see kind of generational leaps on PC just because now you know when we go from Spider Man on PS4 to to Spider Man Two on PS5. Um, it was a game made for PS4, a game made for PS5. They're both on PC as well. You're going to see a difference. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, and that that's, you know, another, it's funny because I, I, I am not exactly a PC gamer, but I play on PC more than most console people, evidently, because console gamers like to pretend that PC doesn't exist um a lot of the time like they'll they'll act like existing coverage on a game that ports to console from pc isn't there (laughs) when when they are that the game like it's already been out there and they're like yeah but uh you know that's just that's just how it is different worlds i guess uh it's it's not an impossible gap to to bridge dare i say i actually think it's the best uh the best combination, the winning combination right now is to have a Nintendo system and a PC, but that's my thoughts. Yeah. Especially with all the, uh, the exodus of games, uh, from Xbox starting to make their way over to basically yeah. everything. Like a lot of their exclusives are moving to PlayStation as well. So I kind of think the, uh, but- the writings on the wall, as as far as generational uh, leaps, uh, you talked about uh, you know going to the N sixty four, just going to three D games in general, Super Nintendo to N sixty four. Obviously, PlayStation's in the middle of that as well, um, and I think that does like if 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 you take that perspective to what all of gaming is doing versus just. And I know if you were a Nintendo person and if your family went from, because so, for so many of us, that was the case. You went from a Super Nintendo to an N64. You may not have had a PlayStation, but you probably were aware of PlayStation, right? Like, Oh, yeah. But the thing with PlayStation is it, it did come out before the N64, but a lot of the 3D games came out at the same time as the N64 or after. So like see but that's my point though is that same generational leap happened from PlayStation to PlayStation. Yes. I mean I'd actually I a part of me wants to actually contend that the real biggest generational leap happened during the lifetime of the NES. If you compare the black box games to the end of life NES games like Kirby's Adventure. Well that's I mentioned that. That's a pretty big. Difference. I mentioned that too. If you if you like one one of the bigger jumps 
probably far bigger than anything that's happened recently is just going from like Atari 2600 to NES. <laughs> you had like, yeah. like eight colors, you know, on an Atari. And a lot of times they weren't even very good. Uh, it, you definitely didn't have any way to have real boundaries in the games. A lot of times uh, to something like Mario, I mean, is mind blowing. Mario looks 15 times better than any Atari game that you can even think of. And I understand there's like the Atari 5200 and the 7800 are around NES's time. Uh, but, you know, from in my household, we went from a 2600 to an NES. So that's how I, you know, perceive that. Well, and even even if you take PC out of the equation, especially for those older systems, it's important too to acknowledge what the arcades were doing because the arcades were the cutting edge back. You know, much like PC is kind of the cutting edge that the consoles keep catching up to today with their generations, so to speak. You know, and back in the day, that was arcade machines is what the consoles were trying to catch up to uh, over and over. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean that's that's kind of. I guess I don't have an answer because, you know, it, you have to be very married to a particular console line to really have this question make any sense. Because, I mean, when I was thinking about kind of to your point with the uh, PS1, you know, being before the the N64 and thinking about that, but what is a, you know, what's a 3D game that, Defined, you know, it is defined on the PlayStation One, like in your head, like whenever you say PlayStation had 3D games, like what's the big one that comes to your mind? Um, well, I don't know what's like earliest, but like one of the first ones I played on a PlayStation was Tony Hawk. Like I, but I know that was on, you know. Oh, that yeah, that was in that was way well, later, obviously. But like I was thinking about it, like one of the big ones that I remember probably the most or being the biggest was like Spyro. You know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Spyro. So uh, Tomb Raider, that's a big deal, right? To some people. <laughs> yeah. So when, when do you think Spyro came out? Uh, 98. 98. So the N60 Mario 64 had already been out for two years. Yeah. Uh, Tomb Raider. When do you think it came out? It was 96, late 96. So again, Mario would have already been out or, you know, close yeah. to that time frame. And arguably Mario 64 looks better than all 3D PlayStation games. Oh, I would agree. <laughs> so, yeah, I would agree with that. so what I'm saying is by the time, like PlayStation exists, but a lot of people forget, like when PlayStation released in 94, there was no 3D games. There wasn't even analog sticks on the, yeah, on the controller. It, it was getting... It was getting ports of Saturn games that didn't run as well on the PlayStation. Yeah. So, like, 3D <laughs> was not a thing at the early days of PlayStation. So, even if you you want to throw PlayStation in there, you know, people that had them, that, that jump didn't really happen until 96. And by that time, you would have already had an N64 present to be able to play 3D games. Uh, so, to me, yeah, the biggest jump... The biggest, the craziest times for me growing up with games was that jump from Super Nintendo to playing Mario 64 in 3D. And it changed everything. I mean. Yeah. And I, I brought up too that like people, I, I just, and part of it comes to my overall opinion and evaluation and how wonderful a thing I think that was. Because even at the time, I was kind of upset uh, about 2D games getting treated like they were just, oh, nobody cares about that anymore. Now, I've brought up several times the contemporary reviews of Castlevania Symphony of the Night that like, oh, you know, the same magazine gave a higher score to Johnny Bazooka Tone. Yeah. Like, what in the world? 2D is dead by that point, you know, is the idea. But really... Yeah, 2D games are dead in 1997. Never mind that they're still alive and well in 2024. Um, it, but I mean, like, as a, I was a kid at the time, and I was like, no, I, I, where's, you know, 
where's the 2D platformers? Like, that's what I wanted to play yeah, still. I, um, I was the opposite. So I, fully I don't really bought have... In. I do not have any real memory of being, like, blown away the way so many other people describe about games being 3D and thinking this was, you know, the, the peak of everything. I, I didn't... I didn't dislike Mario 64 at all. I actually like it more today than most people do, it seems. Um, because I can tolerate the camera not being exactly what I expect it to be. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just always been kind of... I feel like that's overstated. Uh, the importance of 3D... I feel like graphics in general are overstated in gaming, uh, frankly. I think design is more important than than graphics and that's actually why i really do want to say like you know the within the context of the nes going from these kind of arcade based high score games to um you know a whole adventure like zelda or metroid uh let alone you know the late stage ones like mega man 6 kirby's adventure um, and just everything in between, entire genres being invented, uh, like RPGs that just didn't exist until the NES, until yeah. the midpoint of the NES's life. Um, I don't know, but at some point, I, I acknowledge that the question just doesn't have as much meaning for me because I'm not looking at it from that which box was the biggest jump lens. Yeah, and. I mean, lots of people that are at least my age or even a little bit older that, you know, I started with a 2600. My brother had one and playing those games and then going to my grandma's house and she had an NES first and then playing Mario there, you know, and just being blown away by Mario <laughs> at that point in time. And then even, you know, before I even played a Super Nintendo I, my brother had a buddy that had a Genesis that he brought it over to the house and I played uh, Castle of Illusion for the first time and just playing a, a 2D side scrolling game where like the background did things and the, the music was so much more vibrant than an NES and like being blown away by that. But like all those, all those things I remember vividly, but not as, not being as excited as I was to play Mario 64. Like I could not stop playing it. Like, or my mom having to drag me out of Walmart or wherever we were at, probably a Kmart or something like, cause she was already done been grocery shopping for an hour, come back to get me. And I wasn't ready to go yet. You know, <clears throat> that never happened before that. <laughs> it was just amazing. It, I, it doesn't still happen. No. I mean, it probably would if I could play Mario 64 at it. Uh, well, Kmart doesn't even exist That's anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do have some fond memories of the days when uh, the Best Buys would have the giant TVs and the. Oh yeah, you could see them from like anywhere in the store. You could see what somebody was playing. Yep. Yeah, now they're yeah. threatening to almost not sell games anymore. Yeah, I think it's it, the next thing. Yep. Not even gonna sell games. <sighs> Well, what do you, what do you think? You can you can write into our community couch and let us know how. Sam is full of it, and uh, the real change, gaming was changed forever when the Virtual Boy came out. Um, that's the real answer. The greatest leap, the true leap to 3D was the Virtual Boy. I remember that, uh, too. I remember playing one for the first time and, and thinking it was it was cool. And, you know, not owning one for much later, but, I you know, after playing for a long period of time it's like yeah this is cool but it's not like great like not something you could do all the time even the 3ds still kind of had that problem still yeah you know i preferred to play games without the 3d unless actually, they were made I, for i it. was playing the th yeah i was playing the 3ds recently and i forgot how cool the 3d can be but i think it was nice because you had that toggle so if it started hurting your eyes you just turn it off well and i mean there, there was definitely like if you're playing 3d land you know and it's made for the 3d that's that's one thing but like if, if the game, 3DS games kind of became like 3D movies where the movie was not made in 3D, but they went back and added 3D effects to it. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. movies aren't as enjoyable no, to watch. I, I mean, like, well, I was literally, <laughs> I was playing Cold Scepter Revolution, which is not a game really 
that benefits from it directly. I just kind of turned it on. But it's, it's kind of cool just seeing games like that that just have, you know, a uh, like a text box that will actually appear in front of the sprite. Yep. Because of the depth, you know. It's like, oh, I forgot about looking at this because <laughs> I haven't played th- played on an actual 3DS in like over a year. So, yeah. Generational leaps. 3DS That's was cool it when it came out. Any any closing thoughts on that since I, I brought up the Virtual Boy? Oh man. I need to play mine more. That's that's what I'm thinking. I've got I don't have a virtual boy. I'm not sure I want one. I have a, a, a majority share of the games too, so I don't have any excuse. No Jack Bros though. Yeah. No, no Jack Bros. I don't want to pay that uh, much. That's a pricey one. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for listening to RetroLogic Podcast. We are proudly part of the Nintendo Dads family of podcasts. If you like what you hear, you're also welcome to jump into our friendly and 100% non-toxic Discord community. And you can find out more about RetroLogic and all our associated podcasts and uh, content at the website RetroLogic.Games. Have a good night. Bye now. Bye.